Good morning, everyone. It's good morning for me. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, I am really excited. This is a fairly common conversation for me. I spend a lot of my time doing a lot of the work um, at CACASA related to Priya and um, survivors inside confinement. So again, welcome to Priya working with survivors in immigration detention centers. Um, I am Juliana Baez, Program Coordinator at the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, or CACASA. And just like I mentioned earlier, I spend a lot of my time um, in providing technical assistance to um, our 80 plus rape crisis centers in the state of California and um, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, as well as local jails and other types of confinement. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit more about CACASA. So the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, or CACASA, was originally founded in 1980 as a California State Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers. Um, CACASA was created by rape crisis centers from across the state interested in creating a unified voice to advocates on behalf of the statewide needs of survivors, assistance change, funding needs, and policy advocacy. CACASA provides leadership, vision, and resources to rape crisis centers, individuals, and other entities committed to ending sexual violence. At CACASA, we are committed to ending sexual violence through a multifaceted approach of prevention, intervention, education, research, advocacy, and public policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, through ongoing communication and meetings with constituents, CACASA relays the challenges and successes of local work to the statewide and national levels and best practices, evidence-based and practice-based programs at the state and national levels to local constituents as well. And we have programs at the national level, such as Reliance, um, who has a big contract with the NFL and does a lot of the prevention work in the sports setting as well. A quick disclosure that today's webinar will have several challenging topics. Some of the comments that um, I might share are not necessarily those representing the CACASA uh, mission or Colorado Coalition as well. Um, I do encourage you to take care of yourself. We added some of the coloring pages that Maria mentioned earlier to um, the links on your screen. So feel free to print those out and utilize them. Um, as advocates especially, we're very good at promoting self um self-care, but we're not very good at implementing it to ourselves. So please take care of yourself. Um, I also want to uh, let you know that today we will be engaging in conversations of how detention in the United States looks like. Um, we're going to briefly review some of the basics of PREA or the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and we will discuss how to provide sexual assault advocacy and trauma-informed services to detainees in immigration facilities. And I will share a little bit about the projects that CACASA is currently involved in connected to survivors inside confinement. Um, again, this is not a PREA 101. It's not, let's talk about um, the beginnings of PREA. It's just a quick review, and then we're going to spend a lot of our um, conversations on how to provide that advocacy support. So in order to get a firm understanding of the importance of supporting incarcerated survivors, um, we should talk about the basics of detention in America. And before I really get deep into the conversations, and I apologize for this, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type those in the chat box as well. I know Maria is going to try to share those with me as I'm going. And sometimes I get to really passionate of what I'm saying, so I might speed up a little bit the way that I'm talking. You can always remind me to slow down as well. So detention can mean a lot more than prisons and jails, and survivors need an ability to get help. Um, at the, um, excuse me, and the ability to get um, help may vary based on where they're being held. Um, detention refers to any time a person is confined or held by a person authority and it's not free to leave. A person can be held in detention for a matter of hours, such as in a police lockup or for decades, such as in a prison. Um, here I wrote a list, and I apologize, I'm home, my dogs are barking. Um, here I wrote a list of different types of prison, different types of detention settings. Um, the one that I always try to talk a little bit more about and compare is the jails and lockups, just because we typically confuse those. So jails um, are typically where they're waiting to be sentenced and lockups are if you've been arrested and you're only gonna spend there for a couple of hours, um, that's typically where you end up. So I usually like to compare those two um, so that we all kind of have a, a clear understanding of what those are. 
Detention facilities can be um, operated by a number of public or private entities. City police and county sheriffs typically operate jails and lockup facilities. Um, prison systems, however, can be operated by either state or federal government or even private companies contracted by the government from prison operations. In California, for example, state prisons are operated by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation or CDCR. Um, the Department of Homeland Security operates immigration detention facilities. GEO Group and Core Civic, which was formerly known as Corrections Corporate of America, are two of the largest companies operating private prisons in the US. Um, helping survivors who are in detention settings can present many challenges, partly because of the large number of variety of entities advocates encounter. Each system varies widely, and even from facility to facility within the same department, there's there are policy differences that can be difficult to navigate. So those are good things to keep in mind as we are having these conversations and as we're improving the services that you're providing to your survivors in confinement. So here's some statistics, and I love infographs, just infographics, just because it shows a better picture. Um, the Bureau of Justice shares that the American criminal justice system holds almost 2.3 million people in detention. There are 1,719 state prisons, 102 federal prisons, 1,852 juvenile correctional facilities, and eight Indian County jails, as well as military prisons, immigration detention facilities, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in U.S. territories. At the end of the 2007 fiscal year in the United States, immigration detention system comprised of, a, of around 961 sites. The United States incarcerates people at a higher rate than any other country in the world, more than Russia or even China. And there's a huge racial disparity in terms of who is locked up in our detention facilities. And this is, this is vital information, piece of information, as we're thinking about the relationship between racism and mass, mass incarceration. And today we won't talk too much about that, um, really, you know, talking about mass incarceration and the prison system is, is a lot longer conversation. So, um, you know, maybe another day we'll, we'll have that conversation. So here is my first posing question before we really get into the depths of who is inside our detention systems. Um, so please type your answer in the chat box or in the question box. So incarcerated survivors have likely experienced several traumatic experiences over their lifetimes, and we know that, um, including past sexual abuse. So I'm gonna ask you all, what type of trauma do we feel that we find most often inside detention settings? I'll give you a couple of seconds, and if, if you don't have a response for that, that's okay. So just a few are coming in. Um, I have um, someone said racism and sex assault. Um, someone said violence. And I think folks might still be typing, but those are the couple that have come in so far, Juliana. Thank you. And, and those are absolutely correct. Um, survivors in detention have likely experienced several of those traumatic experiences, not only within the confinement, but over their lifetimes, including, like I said before, past sexual abuse. Um, survivors in detention may have long history of child abuse, including physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse and neglect. Um, some survivors in detention may have also witnessed violence in their homes and in their communities. Overall, survivors in detention are likely to experience a number of health disparities, a lack of mental health resources, and appropriate emotional support that they, to address complex trauma experiences. And, um, and this can prevent a survivor from healing from abuse, right? Especially when these traumas are constantly being triggered inside confinement. Um, we always talk about how these traumas are so complex and compound by the experience of just, again, being inside these uh, incarcerated settings. So let me review just really quickly um, some of the basics of CREA, um, just so that we all have the same understanding of my definition and the way that we approach CREA um, when we're talking about this, you know, this conversation. So the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA, was passed in 2003 after years of hard work by advocates and survivors. It's a civil law. PREA did not create any new crimes, but instead describes a course of action to eliminate sexual abuse and detention. 
It states that sexual abuse or sexual assault in detention is a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits um, cruel and unusual punishment. It requires the facilities to adopt a zero tolerance approach to sexual abuse, meaning that they need to take action to demonstrate that no sexual abuse exists. PREA called for three key findings. Nationwide studies to find out more about sexual abuse in detention, funding to help corrections facilities implement the law, and binding national rules known as the PREA standards. These standards were released in 2012. So knowing about systems change a little bit more, it, it shows the big impact of how long it took from PREA, for PREA to be signed to when the standards were implemented. So it took a really long time for everyone to agree to make sure that we were going to um, ensure that there was no sexual abuse inside detention. The ultimate purpose of PREA is to make detention facilities safer. And we know that rape crisis centers have an important part to play in this goal. Advocates can help to provide needed training and support to correction staff, while also providing invaluable services to survivors in need. It's important to know that PREA can be used as an advocacy tool and is, important part, and is an important part of ensuring survivors' rights. However, it does not mandate rape crisis centers comply with any standards or mandates. And that's always important um, because as advocates, we sometimes get into that gray area where we feel like we need to follow up the, we need to be in compliance with the PREA standards, but that you know, belongs to the facilities. It doesn't belong to you. Again, I love to put infographs um, and you know, we're gonna just do a quick review of a lot of these things, but I love this one. Um, and you've, um, you know, it's possible that you've might seen an infograph that looks very similar to this one um, that shows some data of sexual abuse in the community. Um, so we tend to see the same dynamics that exist in the community within detention settings, but sometimes it's a little bit more extreme. So in a 2011 federal survey by the Bureau of Justice, 4% of state prisoners and 3.2% of jail inmates stated that they had experienced sexual abuse in a 12 month period. So that's a lot, right? And for juveniles, this number jumps to 9.5%. As you can see, only a fraction of the survivors reported the abuse, and even a smaller part or a smaller fraction had the report substantiated, which really only means that there was probable cause. It doesn't say that it was found and that um, someone was processed or someone was um, taken into the criminal justice system because of the abuse. It just means that there was probable cause of, um, of some type of sexual violence occurring. This one is more related to immigration detention settings. And this one is from Freedom, of Immigra uh, Freedom for Immigrants, which share, that some of the, who share some of their key findings um, detaining the prevalence of reports of sexual abuse, assault, and harassment in U.S. immigration detention facilities, and the lack of adequate government investigation into these reports. So this one gives us a lot of information, so hang on with me, all right? They analyzed data obtained through a Freedom of Information Act, or also known as the FOIA, which requests for sexual and physical assault data from the, DH, from the Department of Homeland Security Office of Inspector General, also known as the OIG. They filed an FOIA request with other agencies within the Department of Homeland Security, but only, and this one's important to, to remember, only the Office of Inspector General responded to these, um, to these questions. Freedom for Immigrants found that between January 2010 and July of 2016, the OIG received over 33,000 complaints of sexual assault or physical abuse against component agencies in the Department of Homeland Security. But the Inspector General investigated less than 1% of these cases. So the numbers and the discrepancy between it is huge. The OIG received at least 1,016 complaints of sexual abuse or assault um, which reported by the people in detention between May of 2014 and July of 2016, meaning that the OIG received an average of more than one complaint of sexual abuse from people in detention per day during this time period. Freedom from Immigrants found that the OIG investigated only 24 of those complaints, or 2.4% uh, of the total. So again, if we think of the initial uh, number of received complaints to the actual amount of investigated complaints, the number is huge, right? We're talking about 33,000 complaints and only about 24 of these complaints actually being investigated. 
In addition to the 1,016 complaints of sexual abuse or assault reported by people in detention, there were 402 complaints of coerced sexual contact, 196 complaints of sexual harassment, and 380 complaints of physical or sexual abuse lodged against ICE. This data also determined that more complaints were sub um, submitted against Immigration and Custom Enforcement, or ICE, than any other Department of Homeland Security component agency. Of the total number of complaints, 44.4% or nearly 14,700 complaints, again, were lodged against ICE, followed by Customs and Border Protections, or CBP, which are typically your officers in your borders um, checking passports and, and um, residential cards. They also analyzed data regarding calls made to the ICE Aero Detention Reporting and Information Line, also known as DRILL, between October 12 and March of 2016. And according to this data, the higher number of DRILL calls related to sexual and physical abuse incidents came from um, the following facilities. Jenna LaSalle Detention Facility, and it was followed by Houston Contract Detention Facility, Adelanto Correctional Facility, which is in California, Northwoods Detention Center, and the San Diego Contract Facility all top five detention facilities with the most sexual and physical complaints are actually or you know are um, privately operated as well so it's always you know interesting to know that concept and i know i just threw a bunch of information of you so um at this point i want to check in and see if there's any questions or any comments So people might be typing and go ahead and keep typing um, any of those questions or any of those reactions or comments that you have to that data. But so far, Juliana, we don't have anything coming in. Um, so oh. I will chime in as soon as anything comes in. Awesome, thank you. So again, I'm sure a lot of information, a lot of data. So let me ask you a question so that we can kind of regroup, right? After all that information. Who do we typically think uh, perpetrates sexual abuse behind bars? Great, and then um, so hopefully folks are typing in. Um, the first one came in. Um, there's actually a question about what is the ethics breakdown on those numbers you just shared? So um, this was based on a survey um, that, again, Freedoms of Immigration um, tried to successfully complete. Um, it was very, it's, it's a little difficult to answer that question just because they themselves were not able to um, really get that information. I don't know if, if a lot of you know this, but it's really difficult. Well, actually, I'm sure that you all know this. It's really difficult to get any type of data coming out of any type of confinement. Um, they're all very used to being Put on you know on the spot of the things that they have been doing that doesn't necessarily um, put inmates or detainees in immigration facilities so we're talking specifically to that in the human aspect right or humanizing them so it's very difficult to answer that question but um, I can send the link of the of the data that I share so you can all take a look at it a little bit more in depth Perfect, thank you. And then that gave Great. folks an opportunity to answer this question on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. So folks uh, typed in fellow detainees, men, mm -hmm. people in power, and then staff and other detained people. Great, and those are all um, great uh, responses, by the way. So typically when people think of sexual abuse and detention, they think that this tends to be only an inmate against inmate abuse, but you all just shown right now that you have more expertise than that. So it's not just that, right? Um, the research shows that the rate of abuse by staff are nearly the same as by other inmates. And you know, when we talk about the juvenile detention system, this shifts drastically in those settings where youth are far more likely to be abused by staff than by other youth. Um, in juvenile detention, the data shows that it's about an 81% to a 19% of use, right? So in adult facilities, it's 50-50, and youth facilities is about an 81-19, or to make it nice and even for people like me who have a little CD, 80-20 type of thing um, of, of abuse happening. 
And you'll also notice in this image that staff shown here reflect a range of positions. So detention staff refers to more than just the correctional officers. And we're talking about medical and mental health staff. We're talking about volunteers. We're talking about contractors such as kitchen or maintenance staff. We're talking about all detention staff that goes into the facility. There's um, a big array of staff going in there. So it's not unique just to correctional officers. So I'm going to quickly talk about how we see the abuse happening by other inmates and I'll also share a little bit about how we've seen the abuse happening by staff. And again, this is just a quick review, um, but if you have any questions or something triggers, go ahead and ask those. Um, as you know, sexual abuse is not about love, right, lust or attraction. Sexual abuse is a fundamental about establishing and maintaining power and control. This core concept applies as much to prisons and jails as it does in the community um, or to any other institutional setting. Correction staff, and I think this is the one that needed to go first, and I apologize for that because the, the slides got moved a little bit. Um, so correctional staff has ultimate authority over the lives of people in their custody. Abuse that authority is very abuse of authority is actually very dangerous, and they have the code of silence, which is often embedded in corrections culture, which can lead to ignoring abuse, uh, retaliation against survivors to report. Staff perpetrators who literally hold the keys to inmates' freedom uh, may offer survivors contraband and other scarce goods, threaten victims with transfer or longer sentences, or withhold privilege such as access to programming. Remember, they have the key to all these things. Um, sexual harassment and voyeurism can sometimes be inherent in the culture of some facilities and can create a real lack of safety for everyone in there. And this type of abuse is often committed under the guise of normal job functions, which includes observing inmates' behavior to maintain safety and security. Um, their searches of people, bodies, and properties are a daily part of life's in correction facility, and these searches require staff to touch inmates. This can be triggering for survivors of previous abuse. Searches can also um, cross the line into abuse. For the California state prisons, for example, CDCR policy states that searches involving penetration are to be done by a physician and only when a visual, visual search has been inconclusive. Different facilities may train differently on how to conduct an appropriate search. Policies may also be different at different corrections agencies. So always keep that in mind if you have more than one type of correction facility or confinement facility that you're working with, that those might be a little bit different. And it's important to know that due to the nature of power and imbalance between staff and inmates, um, staff inmate relationship is never consensual by law or by policy. And you know, we can provide our expertise as rape crisis center advocates in offering training to staff so that they can recognize abusive situations and vice versa, law enforcement um, can actually request those trainings as well. So how does it look uh, by abuse by other inmates? And consent can be very confusing, right? Consent is, especially in detention. Um, many detention facilities use language such as, um, for consent, no means no, and yes is not allowed. Sex without consent is always illegal, but in detention facilities, consensual sex is mostly, or most of the time, a rule violation. So it's always important to keep that in mind. We see it through protective pairing, which refers to a dynamic that mirrors patterns of relationship abuse and domestic violence in the community. Survivors may be promised protection by other inmates, but are, there ex are then exploited and abused. Because sex can be a major part of the underground economy in prison, sexual exploitation can be common. And these dynamics are similar to human trafficking in the community and can be difficult for correction staff to identify. Um, gangs can sometimes throw other inmates into sex work, particularly those um, that belong to the LGBTQ community. Gang can use rape, Gangs can use rape and sexual abuse as means of extortion dominance over other inmates and maintaining control over their members. And we've recently at CACASA started facilitating a human trafficking and detention training, which has a conversation about how that looks. Um, again, it's very difficult to sometimes connect those two because when we think of human tra uh, trafficking, we think of constant movement and relocation, but it's very typical inside detention facilities as well. Are there any questions um, and the information that I kind of, you know, brief, briefly provided? Any questions, any thoughts before we move on? So, so far, um, nothing is coming in, but definitely okay. as, you're, um, as you're thinking of those comments and thoughts, please feel free to type those in. Yes. So, 
again, now we've identified how abuse may look like coming from staff or inmates, right? So let's discuss a little bit more about what's available to survivors. Um, quickly, I'd like to pose this question because sometimes we, um, I know that most of you are very, fairly familiar with PRIA. I know this is second to last training of PRIA that um, CCASA is doing. So it's always just good to remember those things, you know, what emotional support services are available for survivors in detention. So um, we'll, we'll keep it going and move on to just a brief explanation of what those look like, right? So PRIA requires that survivors in detention can provide access to, can be provided access to emotional support services, including rape crisis center services. Um, advocates generally provide three services that survivors in the community have access to. Those are the crisis line support, hospital accompaniment, and in-person counseling. With appropriate training, commitment, and planning, all of these services can also be provided to survivors in detention. Detention facilities and the people housed there are very isolated from the community. And because of this, one of the main ways detainees communicate with the outside world is through mail. Therefore, there's written correspondence as a fourth service, uh, fourth service to rape crisis and can rape crisis centers can offer to survivors in detention. Pre and confidentiality is always a really interesting conversation, right? Um, especially when we're developing MOUs and when we're um, trying to explain to the staff in the facilities that we're working with that we hold a certain level of confidentiality. Um, so maintaining confidentiality on behalf of incarcerated survivors, again, can be extremely challenging. There are a few important things to know when we're providing these services, so keep these things in mind. Um, correction staffs are required to report allegations of sexual abuse. Information tends to spread fast in detention, you know, and, and most survivors have a well-founded fear of retaliation for reporting abuse. As a result, survivors are often reluctant to seek help from correction officials, especially if their abuse is a staff, if their abuser is a staff member. So keep in mind that as an advocate, working within detention settings um, does not change your legal and ethical principles around confidentiality. In California, for example, the same right to privileged communication that survivors have in the community extends to survivors behind bars. Um, you're not required to report anything behind bars that you wouldn't also report in the community. It's also important to remember and to remind correction staff that is that um, our services are available to all survivors even if they don't report. And that's always caused a little more of a hesitation um, because we've had those conversations of, well, if you don't tell me what's happening, how am I supposed to stop that from happening, right? So there's always that middle conversation of understanding our privileges as, privileges as advocates. I really like this picture and I invite you to print it if you would like to. Um, this, is, this little graphic shows um, what happens if someone reports and what happens or what type of access does um, a survivor have if they report and what if they don't. So here, if they report, they have the right to an advocate during the following services. And if they don't report, they still have access to an advocate for the emotional support aspect via phone or email. And if in your facility you have the accessibility to do it in person, then you can do that as well. So this is, I have this one printed out on my desk. Um, just because it always reminds me that these things are available for all survivors. So this is where we're going to talk a little bit more um, about, specifically about survivors inside our immigration facilities. So um, our detainees, right? Because again, um, a lot of our individuals inside these immigration facilities are not in there because they committed a crime per se. Um, they're in there because of their uh, legal status. So we've developed an understanding of some of the dynamics of sexual abuse now um, and, you know, and the rights of folks to have under PRIA. So let's talk a lot more about how we can help survivors, um, you know, with our services. So let's begin with a discussion of who are survivors inside immigration facilities. Um, they are not prisoners, again, or incarcerated. They're detainees. And every day all over the world, people make one of the most difficult decisions in their lives, right? To leave their homes in search of a safer, better life. Most people in the world had experience, um, have, you know, had to experience leaving the place where they grew up. Um, maybe they will move um, as far as the next city or town, but for some people, they will need to leave their country entirely. Sometimes for a short time, but sometimes forever. There are many reasons why people around the globe seek to rebuild their lives in a different country. Um, 
some people leave home to get an education or a better job. Others are forced to flee persecution or human rights violations, such, such violations such as torture. Um, millions flee from armed conflicts or other crises or violence, and some no longer feel safe and might have been targeted just because of who they are or what they believe. For example, for their ethnic ethnicity, religion, sexuality, or political opinions. And these journeys, which all start with the hope of a better future, can also be full of danger and fear. Some people risk prey to um, human trafficking and others forms another form of exploitations. Some are detained by the authorities as soon as they arrive in the new country. Once they're settled in and start building a new life, many face daily racism, xenophobia, and discrimination. Some people end up feeling alone and isolated because they've lost support networks that most of us take for granted, um, our communities, our colleagues, our relatives, and our friends. Um, so I would like to play this short video of Marcella who shares her story while she was detained at the James Musnick facility in Orange County, California. I really like this video because it really paints a picture of um, some of the struggles that detainees go um, are are actually battling on a daily basis, where they're coming into these settings not knowing the system itself. Right? These settings have been created based on systems from years and years ago, policies that have um, constantly changed um, in paper, but not in in reality. So. Um, it's it's always good to have an understanding of the confusion that they may cause where a, something as simple as them trying to put on a little makeup or be entertained um, can become a very challenging situation. So 
I, um, this video is from Freedoms for Immigrants, which I encourage you to visit. Um, they have an array of resources as well and other videos that um, you might enjoy as you're doing and as you're learning and as you're growing as an advocate and providing um, services to, to those in detainees in immigration facilities. Um, one of the things that we always want to talk about, especially when we're talking about survivors who are inside these um, immigration facilities um, is beginning with just defining cultural competency, right? And why is it important to providing services to survivors in immigration facilities? Um, cultural competency refers to, for example, a program's ability to honor and respect those beliefs, interpersonal styles, attitudes, and behavior, both of the families who are clients um, and the multicultural staff who are providing services. In doing so, excuse me, it's um, incorporate, and we incorporate these values at a level um, of implementing them in policies and administration and in practices. Um, many detainees, like we've shared before, have already experienced trauma before entering the facility. If they then become victims of sexual violence, asking for support, it's not going to be easy, easy accessible, easily accessible um, because of the many layers of, of their own um, culture. So, how do we become more culturally competent, right? So we need to begin by developing our own awareness of differences and understandings of other cultures. We can also make policy changes. Um, we can collaborate with other, uh, with other agencies who might have more of an expertise with the community. Um, we need to accommodate and adjust to the needs of the survivors of sexual assault. Um, we need to become aware of the difference to truly provide a level of trauma-informed care um, we need to keep in mind that misunderstanding is okay but judging is not okay right um, we need to ask about familiar unfamiliar customs or behavior and learn values that drive it um, we we always say that you do not apply your own answers and cultural um your own answer and cultural values to the unfamiliar customs or behaviors Again, misunderstanding can be rectified with respect and communication, but judging can undermine detainees. And I always like to share this story um, from, and I'll speak a little bit more about the projects that CACASA is involved with, but one of the things that um, the warden of one of the ICE facilities over here within the project had to learn um, to challenge and communicate um, was that, um, the cult in the culture of and I can't remember exactly where um, the inmate was the inmates were formed, but it was somewhere in the Middle East where they were they would slap their butts um, as a sign of like hello and and friendship and the facility had to you know learn quickly that um, that was something as part of their culture and it wasn't something that it was um, you know something that someone was going to feel that it wasn't okay within the culture right um, but then they had to again learn this and um, talk to the detainees about it so that they can all be on the same level and understand that that's just not appropriate in that setting um, but again it was having again like I said before it's really having that conversation um, in order to really build those relationships right because again misunderstanding can be rectified um, if we communicate, but judging it, it, it just undermines everyone's. Um, we also want you to remember your core, value, core values. You know, remember that empathy takes you a long way. Listening does as well. Understanding and connecting and building a foundation is extremely crucial, crucial to having a safe, a safe facility and ensuring that all detainees feel safe. Um, we also talk about making materials and resources available. Um, you know, it's it's crucial to ensure that detainees have access to your services. Um, display signs and pictures and artwork that reflects the culture and ethnic group um, of the detainees. Ensure that magazines and brochures and printed materials in the library, um, the library area are in trust to and reflect the different cultures of the individuals, right? So we need to ensure that brochures um, both the detention brochures and the RCC brochures are in different languages um, so that they have access to staff um, to they have access to the information. Um, also, one of the things that we we always talk about, especially in our project, is to have access to a staff or someone who can be um, available, an interpreter who can be available um, so that they are there to be able to be that communication liaison, right? And you know, Sometimes we just need to learn to ask questions and know some of the basic phrases in order to really connect with them. 
um, those are important things to do. Um, you know, learn to collaborate with agencies that represent the needs of these survivors. Again, if you don't have access to any to an advocate who speaks that language, build a relationship with an organization that represents that specific population. I'm sorry, my mouse just moved all over the place. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? This also means that we need to have an understanding of what culture is. Um, again, this is where we get, we confuse ourselves, right? Um, culture includes music and art and customs and decor and dresses, some of the games and recreations, rules and values. It doesn't include res, race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. So always keep those things in mind as well as you're um, having conversations with detainees in immigration facilities, that for them, their culture is very important and their race, ethnicity, and gender, and sexual orientation doesn't necessarily represent those. Um, again, I just threw a bunch of information at you. Is there any questions, any thoughts so far? And if there's not, that's okay. It's a lot of information. I get it. So folks may be typing, but so far, Juliana, we don't have anything coming in. Awesome. All right. So, you know, all of what we've discussed previously is crucial in ensuring that we provide trauma-informed services, right? Understanding that culture, competency, um, and understanding the needs of your detainees that come in, in their different backgrounds. Um, we know that trauma has impacts and being trauma informed is being aware that people have experienced trauma and are processing it in different ways. So let's talk a little bit about um, things to consider when providing emotional support services to detainees in immigration facilities. Um, for example, when we talk about hospital accompaniment, many have maybe never received any type of medical attention. Um, they've never, you know, maybe had a SART exam. And these can be extremely intrusive, right? We all know if we've, if we've been part of the SART exam that they're very intrusive and they're, um, as much as the nurses try to explain things, it's still very much an intimidating situation. So can you imagine someone who's coming who's never received any type of medical support, um, you know, and doesn't speak the language, is not familiar with maybe even the, te the technology that's assess accessible for this art exam, you know, keep those things in mind as you're, um, you know, providing services to detainees in immigration facilities that you should try to have someone who can explain or describe the things the best way that the survivor might be able to understand and they can connect with them, right? Um, so again, begin thinking of how you can provide these advocacy support to survivors um, while keeping your cultural competency lens on. Again, written correspondence, right? There's a possibility that your survivors have maybe never been able or don't have the ability to read or write even in their own language, right? So how are you going to provide this service um, while ensuring that it's a trauma-informed lens and a cultural competency lens, right? Um, if that means that you will have documents that have pictures that describe um, the, you know, for example, if we're talking about the release, the release of information, right? Um, you know, how are you going to describe that document to them in order for them to understand what the release of information is? Um, if you're going to forward some resources to your survivor and they don't have the ability to read or write um, in English or in their own language, um, how are you going to be able to provide that information? So those are things that we keep in mind as, you know, we're providing services to survivors in immigration facilities. Um, In-person support can also be extremely intimidating, right? We talked about how Many survivors are leaving areas where services are not available, and if they were available, they were restricted, right? Um, think of what you need to do to ensure that you provide in-person services that are meaningful, that you can connect with them, that they can feel safe speaking to you. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, recently we've had a lot of refugees coming in from um, Central America, right? And a lot of them are running away from the, um, the violence in their country. That means that they probably have not been able to see someone in person who can support them or advocate for them. So how is that gonna change the way that you communicate with them? And how is that gonna change the way that you go into these spaces providing in-person services? Crisis line, right? Um, in your agency, uh, is your agency prepared to respond to survivors in crisis? And when I say that, I'm saying it, are they ready to provide support in 
different languages? Are they ready to be able to say, I don't have the resources, I don't have the ability to do this right now, but I can send someone. How are you preparing your agency to create the sustainable service to those who might not have access to your language or those who might, again, be impacted by the trauma of leaving their country or um, the trauma of not having any of these resources and really all they're asking for is support, you know? How are you implementing all of these services within the sustainability of your agency so that everyone is able to provide them? Um, it's a lot to think about, right? But once you start thinking about it and implement it into your daily um, work, right, into the sustainability of your agency, then it becomes a little bit more consistent and easier to implement. Um, again, this is a lot of information. So uh, if you have any thoughts, any questions that might trigger, let me know. Um, I always like having these conversations. There's no checklist that we can ever provide to ensure that you're doing what you need to be doing, right? But um, we learn from the narratives that we provide each other. So if there's a specific case or a specific situation that you like to discuss, feel free to always reach out or type it on the chat box if you wanna share with everyone else. So I wanna share a little bit about what CACASA is up to. Um, we are very fortunate that uh, the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, our um, executive director is really out there making these bold movements of uh, you know, ensuring that everyone understands that if we're gonna be able to support survivors, we have to support all survivors. And when we say all survivors, we mean survivors in detention facilities and immigration facilities. We talk about every single survivor um, in order to really impact the um, the the amount of sexual abuse that is happening in our communities. So um, we actually have the California Advancing Priya project, which is now in its fourth year, actually fifth year, um, it just started, uh, which is a partnership between Just Detention International or JDI, um, and it offers offers support and guidance to 22 rape crisis centers who have a California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation facility within their service area. Um, earlier in the presentation, I said that we represent 80 plus rape crisis centers, which we do, um, but only, um, but out of those 80 plus, 22 um, have a CDCRO state prison within their service area. So that's how we got the 22. Um, there's 33 state facilities that we provide technical assistance to, seven community confinements, and in California, um, I'm not sure about Colorado, uh, but we have about 47 fire camps, which um, are sister facilities to a lot of the state facilities um, or the big prisons who, and they're in very remote areas. Um, fire camps are actually um, one of those interesting settings where um, inmates earn the privilege to be part of the fire camps. They are trained like firefighters. They are sent to fight fires um, in the state of California and the brush fires. So if you ever watch the news and you see any of the fires in California, um, most of the firefighters fighting those fires are actually inmates. Um, and we have, most of them are adults and I believe there's one that it's a youth um, fire camp as well. And that is more in the central um, part of California. So those are pretty cool. But again, you know, we talk about the um, sustainability or the, um, capacity of these programs and a lot of them are actually not able to get a job afterwards in the fire aspect of it right so there's all these challenges that come with it but um we do provide the project itself provides technical assistance to all of these entities um we've uh, ensured that they've created sustainable agreements and protocols so that they can provide victim services to survivors um we started with MOUs, we've done trainings, we've actually just released a RCC toolkit that I can forward the link to. I'll give it to Maria so you all can see it as well. Um, it's, it's an RCC toolkit that explains for those who are just starting the work, um, sort of the expectations of what to do and what to expect as you're doing the work with um, your facilities. And it's very focused on the CDCR um, system but it can be applied to many other systems. And soon, um, within the month or so, we will release a CDCR toolkit, which is aimed mostly for PCMs. And when that's available, um, I can always share it with Maria, Maria as well, and she can send it to all of the participants here. So those are some of the things that we've been able to create 
as we are definitely making some shifts in the work that we are doing in providing services to incarcerated survivors. So if you have any questions about advancing Priam, feel free to type them in the chat box or my information will be at the end of the PowerPoint and you can always shoot me an email as well. Another project that we are involved with is Bridge or Building Refuge uh, for Immigration Detainees Through Governments and Engagement. So that's why we name it Bridge because it's a really, really long um, title. And it's very similar to Advancing Priya, that it's building a relationship between rape crisis centers, but instead of the uh, CDCR system, it's with immigration detention facilities in California. Three of them to be specific. Um, we have um, a Mesa Verde, which is in the Bakersfield area. We also have Imperial Regional Detention Facility, which is in the Calexico, Mexico border, and Adelanto, which is actually the second um, most um, challenging facility to work with in the U.S., um, which is in the San Bernardino area. So we have these facilities, and because of Bridge, we've been able to, again, implement MOUs and agreements and ensure that um, these rape crisis centers and advocates are going into the facilities and providing um, victim services and emotional support. Um, since the beginning of Bridge, um, the Imperial Regional Detention Facility um, has actually implemented a lot of more uh, recreational activities such as Zumba, um, barber shop, uh, shop uh, makeup classes, um, you know, a bunch of other extracurricular activities. And because of that, the number of, uh, um, of any type of really abuse has decreased in the relationship between the staff um, and the detainees has increased as well. Um, it's really cool to go into these detention facilities now and see some of the differences. Of course, it's not all rainbows and butterflies, but some of the differences that um, have been able to be implemented because of the work that our advocates are doing and encouraging these facilities to add these types of programming to ensure that everyone feels a little bit more safe. And I mean, they're still in a detention setting, right? They're still confined and they're still being held, but at least have this glance of hope and understand that there's people out there trying to support them and help them. So. Um, there's still a lot of work to do with the immigration facilities, but um, especially highlighting Imperial Regional Detention Facility, they've actually um, gone around the state, um, both the Rape Crisis Center uh, Sure Helpline and the Warden and PCM from Imperial. They've um, been to a few conferences throughout the U.S. talking about the work that they're doing under Bridge. So um, we're really proud of that as well. And again, it's, there's still a lot of work to be done in both projects. There's still a lot of um, systems change to be had, um, but we're doing it. It's, it's slower than we, we wish it would happen, but it's happening. And, and we're ensuring that, you know, if we don't have access to our survivors today, that um, we're going to have access to survivors in the future because we know that a lot of them are going to be in these settings for a very long time. Um, and that most of them are actually going to come outside to be members of our community as well. So we want to make sure that we provide these services for them. Um, right now, I want to open it up to some questions. If you have any questions on either the projects or some of the information that I provided, um, you know, feel free to ask those. Or if you just have any comments, I'm, I'm open to those as well. Great, so we'll give folks some time to ask questions, to type those in. I'm curious, Juliana, you mentioned that um, one of those, I think it was Adelanto, was the hardest one to work with. What mm -hmm. makes it so difficult? Um, what, are, what are some of the pushbacks that you've been seeing? So Adelanto itself has, um, it's, it follows the Texas detention facility. And I know I mentioned it earlier, um, with some of the data that Freedoms for Immigrants had released. Um, they actually are a big facility, so there's a lot of um, things that have happened in the facility um, when it comes to abuse, to neglect, um, that, you know, it's very difficult for them to allow outside people to come in as they're dealing with their own internal issues, right? So because of those things, um, you know, 
the San Bernardino Rape Crisis Center is amazing and they've really been consistent about going in there and ensuring that they're only there to provide services um, for victims of abuse, even if it didn't happen. So it's, it's really having those conversations. But um, for them, it's, it's really having someone, an extra pair of eyes looking at what they're doing that they might not be doing appropriately. Um, so there's many things that have happened in Adelanto, really. Um, if you Google Adelanto detention facility, it, it brings out a lot of uh, a lot of not so pleasant situations that they've encountered. Um, and it's you know it's it's really building those relationships with them and making them understand that you're not there to judge what they're doing, that you're really there for a purpose. Um, one of the things that we always talk about um, when we are, you know, kind of sharing information with our advocates and with those who are doing work is that always, always, always keep your definition, your role very clear to them, right? So that they understand that your role is to provide emotional support to survivors um, and that your role is not there to tell them that they're doing their job wrong or that they're not doing what they're supposed, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So Adelanto is, is a tricky one just because of the history that they have. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit like if we're talking about St. Quentin, which St. Quentin, by the way, is actually um, very, in the aspect of it, is a very, um, very pleasant facility to work with. Thank you. Oh, so, yeah, of course. Um, and then I still don't see any questions coming in, but I'm also curious, as you were talking yeah. about there, about um, clearly defining your role and sticking to that. What are some um, some other tips that you have in establishing those relationships with um, with detention centers, particularly with the immigration detention centers, of being able to go in and provide those emotional support um, services for detainees? Yeah, and you know, one of the things that we've learned quickly with immigration facilities and those that are, pri are run privately is that, um, making changes can sometimes be easier than in those systems such as CDCR or um, the Colorado Department of Corrections, I'm not sure if that's the name of it, um, because their systems um, comes from a chain of commands, right? And when they're privately owned, um, these changes can be implemented fairly quickly as long as someone agrees to them, right? So um, a lot of them like to be catered, um, and, and I hate even saying that, but not cater, but really given an opportunity to showcase their abilities and what they have. So uh, a big part of it is really answering and asking questions all the time. And this goes for both ends, right? So um, when we're talking about advocates, ask them questions. Really, the worst thing that they can say is, I don't know the answer or no, right? And the same comes for um, those in, in law enforcement or in these facilities, you know, ask questions to the advocates ask the Rape Crisis Center what they have access to and what they can provide. You're there to uh, make each other's work related to PREA and survivors a little bit more manageable, right? Because again, facilities, especially those in immigration um, facilities, the staff, really the officers, they don't get the, the training that advocates get. And advocates don't necessarily get the training that, um, that they, the officers get. So really ask each other questions. Um, never go in there judging each other. Um, always be open to a conversation and never take anything personal. Um, it's really not about you, you know, and that goes from both ends, both systems. Because remember, we, the rape crisis centers or the victim service um, agencies are a system of our own, right? So never take any of these systems or these things personal. It's really about the system and how you work and implement these things. Just like rape crisis center advocates have to fulfill specific objectives and requirements, so does correction. So learn to understand that so that you can really work together um, to find that middle ground and ensure that you're providing services. Because at the end of the day, everything that you're doing is to make sure that um, survivors have uh, some access to you and that you know, staff in these facilities have access to ask you these questions because a lot of them, you know, we talk about um, secondary or vicarious trauma, right? Um, they experience that as well. So 
we need to take that system and really start asking these questions and really go in there with a, with, with a fresh lens of understanding that it's not about me, it's about the system that we've created and that we need to work together so that we can ensure that the services are accessible for survivors. And that was a really long answer for that, but I hope that that helps. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, and then also in thinking about um, the differences that you've noticed that you've seen between immigration detention facilities and say other um, other detention facilities. So um, like any you, you know, you mentioned um, some of the differing statistics and all of that, but what are some of the other um, differences that you've seen? So it's detention facilities are very interesting. Um, I know that at the beginning I mentioned, I, I provided a list of the different types of detention settings. Um, so they're all very interesting because they all run and create their own um, policies. And that makes it really difficult for us to be consistent with specific things, right? And that's why I always say that there's no checklist um, because you can't apply the same conversation that you might apply to a jail to a juvenile facility, right? Juvenile facilities now come with this whole mandated reporting aspect of it or who who has um custody of the youth who has all these things so there's there's a lot of things to keep in mind um if if i go down the list of some of the differences you know prisons sometimes are easier to work with um in the system aspect of it right not in the individual aspect of you know building the communication with your uh, PCMs or your pre compliance managers, but it's a system setting, right? If you're able to implement something, then it, it is going to apply to the entire system. And that actually reminds me of, and I'm going to go back a few slides to this one, um, that because of the California Advancing PREA project and the relationship that we build with CDCR, um, that toolkit that I spoke about for uh, PCMs was developed in collaboration with CDCR. So it wasn't something that we developed on our own. We had their input in this as well. Um, we've also been able to implement, and I'm not sure how it works in other states, but in California for CDCR facilities, we were able to implement um, confidential communication. So in the MOUs, we added language that said that if survivors wrote um, penal code 1035.4, which is privileged communication for advocates um, and survivors, that the male will be treated as legal male. So that added the other layer of confidentiality and um, of, of kind of support to the survivor. Um, we've also been able to, and that's a system, right? That the entire system is, is implementing that. We've also added um, the free, non-recorded, confidential, non-monitored calls to their local rape crisis centers. Again, you know, in, in many detention facilities, um, and, and even in the PREA standards, right? Um, the PREA standards say that it should, access to an advocate through a hotline should be as confidential as possible. So there's room for the interpretation there, right? Well, we were able to really advocate and ensure that um, the system that they have really provided confidential support. Um, the setting is not as confidential, of course, that's just the nature of the setting, but the system itself is, so now, um, survivors um, and all detainees and and it also and it's also applied now because of bridge to these three facilities so Mesa Verde, Imperial and Adelanto now um, their system or their phone system is programmed with the number of the local rape crisis center and when they dial that number the call now becomes confidential it's no longer recorded and it's no longer monitored by the facility and it's free it's free of charge we know that a lot of these calls are collect. You, you know, you pay the rape crisis centers or the detainee or inmate paid. So because of these two projects, we've been able to implement these things. Um, so again, it became easier to work with these systems. Um, but you know, when it comes to those smaller ones, such as like the jails, because some jails are run by city, by the city, some are not. Um, the community confinement, some are run by the city, some are run by a private proper, you know, uh, agencies and immigration facilities the same. Those become a little bit more challenging because um, there's no consistency in the way that you can change these things. So I, I hope that, again, that was a really long explanation, but I hope that kind of touches a little bit of what you were asking. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and it doesn't look like other questions have come in. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to share, Juliana, before we before we wrap up that you want to leave folks with or any additional information? Um, no, just thank you for joining us. And I know this is a lot of information. Um, I completely understand, you know, that we need to process everything that we hear. Um, I will be sharing uh, with Maria the link of the RCC toolkit um, so that you can share it with the participants so they can take a look at that. Um, again, we haven't released the CDCR PCM toolkit yet, uh, but as soon as that's available, I would share it with you all. Um, here is my information. If you ever have a question or just want to talk about something, um, if you want to, you know, discuss a narrative or, or a situation that's happening, feel free to call me or email me. Um, I'm always you know available and really enjoy having conversations about how we can um, definitely provide services in the system way right in, in the systems that we're dealing with and and in the systems that we're constantly um, learning from because again like I said earlier we're both systems right the rape crisis center aspect of it and the corrections aspect we're systems that we need to understand each other and work with each other um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if there's anything that later on triggers and you want clarification on, feel free to contact me as well. Perfect. Thank you so much again, Juliana, for um, all of this amazing information that you've shared with us today and for being open um, to continue the conversation with our participants moving forward. Um, I also want to thank you all for being here and for spending this afternoon with us. I hope that this was helpful for you. Um, just as a few reminders, any questions that you might have that come up for you, um, please feel free to reach out to, to Juliana. I will be sending her contact information in the follow-up email as well um, and that will be coming in the next 30 minutes to an hour um, so keep an eye out for that um, we will be having our next webinar we don't have the title yet but it will be presented by the Asian Pacific Development Center and it will be on June 26 from 12 to 1 30 and they'll be talking a little bit about culturally specific shelter services and how to um, how to make sure that um, if you're working at a shelter and providing services there how some things to consider um, when thinking about folks who, um, who are culturally diverse. Um, so we hope to see you there. Keep an eye out for more information on that. Um, please do remember to fill out the survey. Again, that's very helpful for us and for our presenters. And I just want to say again, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Juliana. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.